Have you ever opened up your Bible and tried to read it from cover to cover? Maybe you've started in Genesis and you've read halfway through Exodus and there's lots of interesting stories and then you get to the second half of Exodus and you have this description of the, how to construct the tabernacle and then it's all repeated at the end of Exodus, chapter after chapter about how the tabernacle was built. It's really tedious if you don't know what the subject's about. And much of the Old Testament is like that, and it's easy for us, reading the Old Testament as Christians, to think this is all irrelevant. This is only about God's relationship with the Jewish people. Praise God, we only need the New Testament as Christians. Oh, but we're missing out on so many riches. So if you've ever got frustrated, and you've, if you've ever asked yourself, is the Old Testament relevant for Christians today? Welcome to Parkside Evangelical Church. My name is Pastor Rory McClure. I'm the pastor of this church, and I want to welcome you to this, our online service. We'll be asking that very question as we look at Hebrews 9 and continue our uh, series through that glorious book that opens up to us a completely different way of looking at the Old Testament. But we want to stay focused on Jesus, and we don't just want to try and listen to the Word of God. We want to respond to the Word of God in praise and prayer. So join us now as we worship our glorious God. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name for ever and ever. Every day I will bless and praise your name for ever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. And so we're going to do that now as we worship God. We're going to do that in the words of this, our opening hymn, The God of Abraham Praise.
Will you join me in prayer? Lord, what a wonderful thing to be able to sing that wonderful hymn, to sing you, the ever faithful God, faithful to us from age to age, faithful to us in the New Testament age and faithful to us in the Old Testament age. We thank you and praise you, dear Lord, our God and our King. We want to bless your holy name forever and ever. We want to praise you and worship you because your greatness is unsearchable. Lord, we want to hand on this, our faith, from one generation to another. We thank you for all previous generations of Christians and the people of God who have handed on these glorious truths to us today. But Lord, we want to hand those wonderful truths on to future generations so that one generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty works. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, we want to meditate now, to think and remind ourselves that you are the unchanging, ever faithful God. The way you communicated in the Old Testament was the different to the way you communicate in the New Testament, but you communicate exactly the same truths and we praise you and worship you for this. We want to think about the glorious splendor of your majesty and on the mighty works that you have done. We want to hear what you have done, the might of your awesome deeds, and we want to declare your greatness. We want to declare your fame and your abundant goodness. We want to sing aloud of your righteousness. So Lord, send down your Holy Spirit that we may love you and worship you, that we may know you and draw you closer, that we may be strengthened by you and blessed by you. Bless us and help us, dear Lord, to your great glory. Amen. I'm going to sing now God's praises in this new song. It's one familiar to us, but it's written more recently. You are our song from age to age. God of power, living word, the one who made the stars, who with your glory fills the earth from dust made beating hearts. You loved us when we fell away, poured mercy on our souls. And promise grace will come to save To loose death's iron hold You are our song from age to age Our voices unite to recount your praise Again and again Promises fulfilled The God who took on flesh Who did all that the Father willed Was humbled unto death You bore our cross of sin and shame Endured our agony With gladness we now
arms are the light Where eyes of faith have strength to see Will one day fill our sight Will all the saints will lay our crowns Before the Savior's Will you join me in prayer again? Our God and Father, our Creator, our song from age to age, our hope, our joy, our expectation, our rescuer and our redeemer, we thank you and praise you, dear Lord, that you are ever faithful. Lord, we confess to you that we are not always faithful to you. We let you down in thought and word and deed. We let ourselves down. We hurt you. We hurt ourselves, we hurt other people, we don't do the good things we ought to do and we do bad things we shouldn't do. We confess these things to you as sin and we ask for mercy. We ask for mercy only on the basis that Jesus died on the cross for our sins sins, and you have promised to forgive us and we thank you for that forgiveness. We thank you, dear Lord, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us from all unrighteousness and wash us and clean us and make us whole and restore us again. Lord, we thank you that our eternal souls are secure in you forever and ever. But Lord, we also need your grace and mercy to live in this world. We want to pray for those who grieve. Lord, you know that there was a funeral earlier in the week and we want to pray for the whole family. We just ask, dear Lord, that you would draw close to them. And we want to pray for all of the widows and widowers that are struggling with isolation and loneliness and grief, that are missing their loved ones. Lord, have mercy on them. Our God and Father, we know that others are struggling with their physical and their mental health. Have mercy on them, bless and heal them. Give them peace, give them strength, give them healing, give them the appointments that they need. We want to pray for our loved ones, our friends, our relatives, those that do not yet know you. We ask, dear Lord, that you would overcome their resistance, you would soften their hearts, that you would draw them closer and closer to yourself, that you would give them a hope and a joy and an expectation. Dear Lord, please have mercy on them. We want to pray for our nation. And again, we want to thank you that the COVID cases continue to drop. We want to give you the glory for that. We thank you for the increasing freedom that we're able to enjoy. We pray that we would hold on to that freedom. We pray, dear Lord, that we would be able to meet together as a church, as a whole church, that we would be able to have all of the chairs and all of the seats out and that we would be able to sing your praises without masks or hindrance or fear and that you would receive the glory. Please restore the glory of your name soon. Oh, Lord, please have mercy. Lord, we ask that you would uh, give wisdom to our government. We pray for our queen in her mourning. Have mercy on her as well. Lord, we want to lift up to you this broken world, so full of evil and problem, problems, so full of injustice, so full of greed and materialism, so full of lies and manipulation. Lord, please, the only solution to all of this is for you to have mercy. Please, dear Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit. 
Bring your people back to the authority of the word of God. Give us courage to stand and do what is right. Give us grace and mercy, dear Lord. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing uh, a psalm now. Uh, this is Psalm 84. How lovely is thy dwelling place. And last week, you'll remember that we start to, to think about how we are the heavenly Zion. We are the church of the living God. We, the church, are the inheritors of all of the blessings of the covenant. I mentioned in the prayer just now that we had a funeral, and yet the person that we uh, celebrated and gave God the thanks for his life, he is now in the dwelling place of God. And that should be our holy longing, to be with God, to experience that, yes, in this life, among God's people, in his worship, but ultimately, perfectly and forever. We want to dwell in the tabernacle of God forever in heaven and there to know and love and worship him. So will you sing with me Psalm 84, How Lovely is Thy Dwelling Place? I don't know if you ever enjoy going round junk shops or maybe flea markets. They don't sound great, do they? Junk and fleas. Who wants that? But there's always something quite fascinating about them. Maybe you're a bit more sophisticated and you don't go to those places and you go to antique shops. But nevertheless, you can look at all of these things and something will catch your eye. Some, something else will be a bit curious and odd, but most of it is just junk. It's not relevant to you. But when you know the story behind some of those objects, maybe, maybe they're a little bit more interesting. Got this picture here and uh, just imagine, you can see there, there's some set squares that architects use. Imagine if those belonged to Christopher Wren and that Christopher Wren used those very set squares to design St. Paul's Cathedral. Those set squares would suddenly take on an enormous meaning and importance. There's a conch shell you can see in the photograph as well. And now imagine that that was James Cook, Captain James Cook, who traveled to the other side of the world in, this, in the 18th century, explored and discovered Australia. And that would be fascinating if he brought that all the way back from the South Sea Islands. And it had that history and that story that this belonged to this great sea captain. 
have a look at the, uh, the hookah. And that's the, one of those things that Arabs uh, smoke from. Now imagine that that belonged to Napoleon when he went in the 19th century to invade and conquer Egypt. And that was one of the things that he brought back and it belonged to Napoleon. And suddenly it's no longer junk. These things mean enormous amounts and they become precious and important. But if they have no story, they're just a collection of junk and something might attract our eye, might attract our curiosity, but most of it we just walk by. Well, as we're reading the Bible, we can often read a whole series of different things. And if we don't know what the story is to those things, to put it bluntly, they can just seem like a shopping list of junk. But when we understand the story behind those individual objects, suddenly we become aware of the importance of these things. We've been following a series as we work our way through Hebrews. And we finally got to chapter 9. And chapter 9, the first few verses, has a list of items. And those items don't seem particularly important or we don't really understand the relevance of them unless we understand the rest of our Bibles really well. And suddenly they open up to us and we can get really excited about these things. So let's bow our heads as we come to the Word of God and let me see if I can convince you of the importance of this collection of items so that you can understand how wonderful and rich and deep the Bible is, how it all ties together, and that you too can get excited about reading the Old Testament, see how relevant it is for us as New Testament Christians today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, bless the reading of your Word. We pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Give us hearts and minds that will understand this, your Holy Word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship in an earthly place of holiness. He's talking there about the old covenant that God had with the Jewish people. It's been replaced now with the new, t uh, new covenant that the Jewish people can also join in, but is it uh, is the covenant that we have with God now. But the, under the old covenant, the rules and regulations that were given to Moses, a tent was prepared. The first section in which the lampstand and the table and the bread of presence, it is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna, an Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Isn't that a frustrating last little phrase? Uh, I remember when I started to take the Bible really seriously and I started to really read it and think about it and long to understand it better, reading that phrase and thinking, oh, it's so frustrating. Oh, if only he'd spent another chapter trying to unfold and unpack what these things mean. He obviously uh, knew that there, it wasn't just a list of junk that he was talking about here. These things had tremendous importance, but the light writer of the letter to the Hebrews just didn't have time. He wanted to stay focused on other things, but we have time. I think he very much intended that these uh, this letter would be preached to churches and that the faithful ministers would understand it and understand it in the context of the rest of the Word of God and that they would open it up to the congregations and that that's exactly what's happened. For the last 2,000 years, even though the overwhelming majority of people that have read this letter haven't actually been Hebrews, they haven't been uh, ethnically Jewish, church across the ages has come back to this letter and has rediscovered the validity and the importance and the joy of the Old Testament. And so we can draw on their insights handed down to us and we can bring them to ourselves and hand them on to future generations as well. I love the Bible. But the reason I've loved the Bible so much is because I've always uh, knew that I had my limitations. I didn't know the Bible as well as I should. I hadn't studied it as deeply and as much as I should. And so I have always benefited from men wiser and more godly and more pious and more intelligent and more diligent than I am. 
And these men have written wonderful Bible commentaries that have given me insights that I would have never come across myself. One of my favorite older Bible commentators, and he's remained in print for the last three or 400 years, is Matthew Henry. Matthew Henry was right, uh, lived at the end of the 1600s, at the beginning of the 1700s, and he wrote this multi-volume Bible commentary uh, covering Uh, the whole of the Bible, from Genesis all the way to Revelation at the end. And he's got a lovely devotional insights into uh, uh, loads and loads of faithful applications that open up the whole of the Word of God to us. And so I'm going to use him as our guide. I'm going to use him as our instructor. I'll open up some of his insights. I'll show you why his insights are faithful and godly. I'm going to show you why we can take this, his approach to the Bible and discover deeper and richer and deeper treasures. Even in a boring list like this, we'll discover that they're not boring at all. These are things that should warm our heart and our devotion to Christ and give us courage and confidence and meaning and purpose in this life. So, Matthew Henry writes, The apostle gives us an account of the tabernacle, that place of worship which God appointed to be pitched on earth. It is called an earthly place of holiness. Holy of this earth, as to the materials of which it was built, and a building that must be taken down. It is called an earthly place of holiness because it was the court and the palace of the king of Israel. So Matthew Henry is telling us that this earthly thing belonged to this earth. It was pointing towards something spiritual, in other words. It was a signpost pointing upwards to the heavenly tabernacle. But symbolically, this was to be the court of the great king. This was to be the dwelling place of God in the midst of his people. This tabernacle, Matthew Henry continues, was a moving temple foreshadowing the unsettled state of the church militant. It's interesting, in the Old Testament, uh, God ordered the building of the tabernacle, and it was a great big tent. It was intended for the Jews out in the wilderness as, uh, as they were working their way to the promised land, and then for hundreds of years, it was the principal place where people met to worship God. It moved around. If you read through uh, the Old Testament history, it's quite difficult to follow exactly where the tabernacle was and where the Ark of the Covenant was and where they at the same place place at the same time. Lots and lots of mysteries, but the, the tabernacle didn't have a settled place. Eventually, David went to God. Notice God didn't take the initiative. God took the initiative for Moses to build the tabernacle, but David went to God And he took the initiative and he said, will you settle down, please? Can I build you a house somewhere permanent that you can dwell in our midst? Sadly, he wasn't able to build it. And Solomon, uh, he built the, the, the temple in Jerusalem. And that temple, that first temple, was destroyed by the Assyrian, sorry, by the Babylonians. It was rebuilt again by Zerubbabel after the exile, when the Jews returned from exile. Uh, and uh, they built a second temple, and that fell into a level of disrepair when, uh, uh, when Herod the Great uh, uh, re- started to rebuild it around the time that Jesus was born. He died very shortly after Jesus was born, and then the te- temple was absolutely splendid, but that temple too was destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. God never dwelt permanently in any of these structures. They were just symbolic and they were pointing towards something far greater. And it's the same, tr- uh, the same is true with us as the people of God today. God dwells in our midst today, but we're on the move all the time because this world isn't ultimately our long-term home. We are just, sit- uh, we are just sojourners as we pass through this life and our citizenship is in heaven. And so it's a good helpful insight to think of the tabernacle as being an image of us. After all, Paul says in Corinthians that we are God's temple, and he says the same thing in Ephesians, that we, the whole building of the church, the whole building of all the people of God has been fitted together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And that's who we are. We're on the go. We're on the move. 
And so Matthew Henry's insight is exactly what the Bible teaches. He also says that the tabernacle was a foreshadowing of the human nature of the Lord Jesus, in whom the fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily. That's not obvious if you don't understand uh, Greek or Hebrew, uh, but if we uh, take an insight from one of the words in John, John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, the word, speaking of Jesus, the eternal son of God, and the word became flesh, he became a true human being, and dwelt among us. That word dwelt is uh, eskenosin, which means quite literally, uh, you can translate that as to pitch, a t to pitch a tent or to dwell in a tent. So we could translate this perfectly uh, legitimately as the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Just as God, the eternal God, was happy to symbolically dwell in that tabernacle. In the Old Testament, Jesus his, the vessel of his body was the dwelling place of the eternal God himself. And he tabernacled, he dwelt among us. In Hebrews, he goes on to talk about behind this uh, um, uh, was the holy, uh, sorry, it's, uh, there's the holy place. And behind this is uh, the, called a second curtain, a second section called the most holy place. So there was two sections. That's probably easier to have a diagram. Here's a diagram, it's a cross section through the, uh, through the tabernacle. And you can see that at the front where the priests would go out on a, in and out of in a daily place uh, basis, they would go into the holy place. And it was twice as big as the most holy place, sometimes called the holy of holies. And there was a great big curtain dividing the two. So think of that, a big long tent divided into two, the front half used regularly uh, and used on a daily basis, twice as big. And then at the back of the tent, beyond a second veil, there was the most holy place where only the high priest would go on the Day of Atonement once a year. Matthew Henry continues, now this tabernacle, it was said it was divided into two parts, an inner and an outer part, representing the two states of the church, um, church militant and the church triumphant. The church militant is us here on earth. As we wage spiritual warfare, as we fight the good fight, as we pass through this world, as we seek to conquer territory for the uh, kingdom of God, we're the church militant. But ultimately, we are also the church triumphant. And the church triumphant is the victory that we have in Jesus when we go to be with him in heaven. And so, as we'll learn, the first half, the, uh, the holy place, is full of symbols pointing us towards God's ability to nurture us in this life. And then we have the heavenly reality beyond that. We have this uh, in the holy of holies. We have an insight into the very nature of heaven itself. But he also goes on to say that that division in the tabernacle speaks of Christ and his two natures. He's 100% man and 100% God. Continue. <clears throat> uh, um, in Hebrews chapter 9, it talks about a lampstand. The lampstand, Matthew Henry says, where the lamps were always burning. And there was need of it, for there was no windows in the sanctuary. This was to convince the Jews of the darkness and of the mysterious nature of that dispensation. Their light was only candlelight in comparison to the fullness of light which Christ, the Son of Righteousness, S-U-N, the Son of Righteousness would bring with him and would communicate to his people, for all our light is derived from him, the fountain of light. And so, yes, there was darkness. The, the darkness in the holy place lit only by that seven-branched candlestick, that darkness reminded the Jews that the full light of God's revelation had not yet come. But now we have escaped that darkness and we are basking in the sunshine of the eternal God himself. God has revealed himself in all that we need to know in this life. And so we look at the Bible and the Bible 
uh, we read there that your word is a light to my path and a lamp to my feet. And we can see in Christ, Christ the light of the world, we can see all things and all things make sense in his light. Secondly was the table and the bread of presence. And so there was uh, a, um, a table in the tabernacle and it had uh, um, 12 uh, bits of bread stacked up on top of it. It's covered in gold. Matthew Henry tells us that the table and the showbread were set upon it. And the table was set directly opposite the landscape uh, la um, candlestick, which shows that by light from Christ, we must have communion with him and with one another. We must not come in the dark to his table, but by light from, uh, from Christ, we must discern the Lord's body. And so Matthew Henry is here talking about one of the main methods that God sustains our souls through this life. And that's through the Lord's table, the Lord's Supper, the communion, the Eucharist, uh, whatever you want to call it. The bread and the wine that we receive is intended to be us, the very blood and body of Christ, to give us strength and nurture our souls so that we can uh, follow Christ throughout this life. But we can only do that in the light of Christ, in the light of the Word of God. We need all of the insights of the, uh, of the light of Christ and the Word of God to help us to know and understand what we are receiving as we feast on the Lord's table, as we receive the bread and the wine. On this table were placed 12 loaves for each of the 12 tribes of Israel, a loaf for each tribe. These remain from Sabbath to Sabbath and on that day were renewed. The showbread may be considered as either the provision of the palace or the provision made in Christ for the souls of his people, suitable to their wants and to the relief of their souls. Jesus is the bread of life and we may have supp fresh supplies from Christ, especially every Lord's day. And so we come back week after week Every Lord's Day, every Sunday, we return back to Jesus to feast afresh on the bread of life. We come to him to be filled and strengthened again. And so just as bread can go stale after a week and become inedible, so too, if we only take, uh, take Jesus seriously, just at our convenience, just once a month, just a couple of times a year, so the bread of life will too become uh, stale to us. We'll lose our spiritual health and vitality. We come back to him to feast on him afresh, week by week. The writer to the Hebrews talks about the second curtain. So in the, in the tabernacle, I said it was divided into two, and there was this veil or curtain dividing the holy place from the uh, holy of holies. Matthew Henry writes, we have an account of what was in the inner part of the sanctuary, which was within the second veil, which is called the holiest of all. This second curtain, which divided between the holy and the most holy place, was a type of the body of Christ, whose death is not only gives us a view into the holy of all, a type of heaven itself. And so what's the connection there? Well, we learn at, death, at Jesus' death on the cross, Jesus uttered, a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. In other words, that mighty barrier that prevented people coming into the presence of the living God himself was ripped in two. Jesus associated himself with that veil. And when he died, he opened up the way for us to approach a holy and glorious God. He goes on to mention the altar of, golden altar of incense. So Matthew Henry says that this golden altar of incense, which was to hold the incense, was also a type of Christ. See, the priest would go in on a regular basis to pray for the people. And as he did so, he would put incense on this uh, golden table. He would light it and the smoke would go up and fill the, temp the tabernacle or the temple and... That would, uh, um, that was an essential part of their worship in the Old Testament. 
So the, this incense is a type of Christ. It's pointing us towards Christ and his pleasing and prevailing intercession, which he makes in heaven, grounded on the merits and satisfaction of his sacrifice and upon which we are to depend for acceptance and blessing from God. Jesus always intercedes for us in heaven. He is always praying for you and for me. And we know again from Revelation, uh, the last book of the Bible, the smoke of the incense. John the Apostle had this insight into heaven. He says that the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God and from the hand of the angel. And so there's a clear identification between the incense and the prayers of the saints which rises up towards God as a pleasing and holy aroma to him. The writer of the Hebrews goes on to talk about the Ark of the Covenant covered in all sides with gold. And so there was this holy box. It was, empty, uh, it was a box made of gold, beautifully carved, carried on poles, something that, uh, that Moses was instructed to make. And he says that the Ark of the Covenant was overlaid round and about with gold. This typified Christ and his perfect obedience to the law and his fulfilling of all righteousness for us. So, of course, we associate gold with royalty and with importance, with dignity, with uh, some uh, um, incorruptibility, with a luster and a shine. And all of these things should remind us of the majesty and the beauty of King Jesus. So inside this box, inside the Ark of the Covenant, he tells us that there were several things. There was a golden urn holding the manna. Let me give you the background story to that. When, the, um, uh, when God told Moses to lead the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, they went into the wilderness. And in the wilderness, they couldn't grow their own vegetables. They couldn't uh, graze their flocks or anything else. Uh, they had a tremendous need to be able to feed themselves. And so God miraculously provided them with food, a food called manna. And every day they had to go afresh and eat it and gather it for themselves to draw sustenance and life from that. But every day, uh, every night, it would rot and they would have to go afresh and get more. However, God also told Moses to take a pot to fill it with manna and it was placed in the ark and there it never rotted. It was a permanent testimony to that mir miracle. So Matthew Henry writes, the golden pot that had manna, which when preserved by the Israelites in their own houses, contrary to the command of God, then putrefied, rotted. But when, by God's command, it was deposited here in the ark, it was kept from putrefaction, always pure and sweet. This is to teach us it's only in Christ that our persons, our graces and our lives are kept pure. The manna was also a type of the bread of life which we have in Christ, the true health food that gives immortality. This was also a memorial of God's miraculously feeding his people in the wilderness that they might never forget his gracious provision nor distrust him for the time to come. And so we too can feast on Christ spiritually, but we can also look to God to provide to us day by day. These permanent records don't need to be kept in a box anymore because they're kept in the word of God. And these promises should be kept in our own hearts and expectations too. And so we can look to God to provide for us as well. The writer to the Hebrew also talks about Aaron's staff that budded. And again, there's a background story to this. So the story is that uh, there was, uh, they'd been in the wilderness for probably about 38 years, certainly a long time. Uh, we read this story in Numbers and people were just fed up of living in the wilderness. Where's this promised land you keep telling us? We want to go back to Egypt. We want to go into the promised land. They just grumbled and they decided that what they needed was uh, an election. They would just uh, choose themselves some new leaders and they would depose uh, Aaron and Moses, uh, and they would, uh, they would take, our, uh, take God by the scruff of the neck and tell him what to do. Well, anyway, God didn't practice democracy in the Old Testament. It wasn't up to a popular vote. It was the man he chose. And so Moses, to end the, the, any debate, 
ask the men to bring their rods. Those could have been staffs like shepherd uses. They could be uh, bat batons, uh, uh, symbols of power. It doesn't really matter. But they were told to take them. They took 12 of them and Aaron's as well. And then one of them came to life. One of them was made of almond wood and it budded. And almond blossoms came forth on this staff miraculously. And that was Aaron's rod. God overcame the rebellion. He confirmed that Aaron was the high priest. He was the leader of God's people. He was the spiritual high priest and spiritual authority had been given to him and to him alone. And so Aaron's rod, which bonded, was kept as a permanent record in that holy box. This was the, the cent center of everything that was important for God's people to remember. So Matthew Henry writes, Aaron's rod that budded and thereby showed that God had chosen him of all the tribe of Levi to minister before him in all the tribes of Israel. And so was put an end to the murmuring of the people and their attempt to usurp the priest's office. This was that rod of God which Moses and Aaron wrought such wonders and miracles. And this was the type of Christ by whom God has wrought wonders for the spiritual deliverance, defense, and supply of his people and for the destruction of their enemies. This was a type of divine justice by which Christ the rock was smitten and from whom the cool, refreshing waters of life flow into our souls. That last little thing was referring to that miracle of Moses taking Aaron's rod and smiting the rock and providing water, an abundance of water for God's people in the wilderness. But more importantly, that, uh, that Aaron's rod in the Ark of the Covenant points us to the fact that God has appointed one faithful high priest and nobody else. For us living in the New Testament, we have the fulfillment of that in Jesus Christ. He is our great, our perfect, our holy high priest. He and he alone is our high priest and we look to him and him alone to intercede for us. And finally, he talks about the tab uh, tablets of the covenant. Some of you have iPads and others of you have tablets, basically an iPad which isn't made by Apple Macintosh. And so uh, um, you know that an, a tablet is something that can be written on and it can be flat. You can have a tablet of slate and you can write in chalk on that. That's the type of tablet they was talking about. It's the tablets of the covenant. Uh, in other words, it's the Ten Commandments. So the, uh, God, Moses went up Mount Sinai and God gave him two tablets. And on them were written the Ten Commandments. So the tablets of the covenant in which the moral law was written signifying the regard which God has to the preservation of his holy law and the care we all ought to have to keep the law of God that this we can only do in and through Christ by strength from him and nor can our obedience be accepted unless it is through him. And so the Ten Commandments are a, a reflection of the character and the uh, priorities of God himself. You want to know what Jesus would do? You look at the Ten Commandments and you could say, this is Jesus' priorities. This is what he would do. And so God placed the law of God within the, the Ark of the Covenant as a permanent reminder of his character, his priorities. His desire is that the Ten Commandments should be at the heart of God's people and should be just as precious to us because we want to become more and more like Jesus. He mentions the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. So the cherubim of glory, Matthew Henry writes, were shadowing the mercy seat representing the holy angels of God. All God's angels take pleasure into looking uh, into the great work of our redemption by Christ and are ready to perform every good office under the Redeemer for those who are heirs of salvation. The angels attended Christ at his birth, at his temptation his agonies in the Garden of Gethsemane. They were there at his resurrection and at his ascension, and they will accompany him at his second coming. 
And so those angels are a reminder that God is surrounded by figures of glory and strength and power. But those angels look down. They look down towards where the Ten Commandments are. They look down on the holiness of God. And there we see our own imperfection. When we look to God's moral law, we don't see a reflection of ourselves and our priorities. We see our failures. The angels, as it were, look down on our condemnation, on our failures, on our guilt. But there's a barrier. There's a barrier that prevents them from seeing the tablets of the Ten Commandments. And that barrier is called the mercy seat. So he mentions the mercy seat, and Matthew Henry says, the mercy seat, which was the covering of the ark. See, the ark was a box, and it had this movable lid on, on the top of it. The angels were on top of that lid. They looked down, these cherubim looked down on that mercy seat, on that lid. It was of pure gold, as long and as broad as the ark in which the tablets of the law were laid. This was an eminent type of Christ and his perfect righteousness, fitting perfectly the dimensions of, our law, of the law of God and covering all our transgressions, interposing between God's perfect standards and our sinful failures and fully covering them. And so the mercy seat, the mercy seat is where the high priest once a year on the day of atonement would come in and he would scatter blood on the top of that mercy seat. And all of God's people would be reassured of God's forgiveness. The angels no longer look down on the, God's holiness and our failure. Rather, they looked at the blood. And that blood and the mercy seat covered all of our condemnation, covered it and hid it from our eyes. And they can see nothing but blood and gold and mercy. And that's the foundation of our relationship with God. We are no longer under any condemnation. And all the holy angels look at you and me and we are no longer condemned because the righteousness of Christ covers us perfectly. It is paid fully and we are set free from guilt and shame. And so we have enormous joy as Christians, knowing that we are heirs of the Old Testament, knowing that the Old Testament is constantly pointing to, towards Christ. The Old Testament is 100% relevant for us. And with these insights that we gain from the rest of the Word of God, and especially from, from uh, the book of Hebrews, we can re-look at the Old Testament and our hearts can be thrilled and we can see, yes, this is about us. It's always been about us. It's always been about God's desire to bless the nations. We're going to conclude our worship and we're, again, we're going to sing another psalm. And one of the reasons that we've come back to the psalms is that there's not too many hymns that are written about the tabernacle and about the temple and about uh, our spiritual relationship with Christ and everything else, whereas the psalms are full of those images. And again, we need to take some of these insights and do a little bit of translation to see the relevance. And so we're going to be, uh, conclude our worship with singing uh, Psalm 132. It's a long psalm, so we can't sing the whole thing, but here's a few, few, few verses that will give us an insight. Uh, this translation is designed for singing, so it's been designed, uh, it's been translated into rhyming meter, uh, rhyming poetry, but it's still a, a tremendous desire to remain faithful to the original meaning. And so this psalm says, Lord our God, remember David and the hardships which he bore. This is talking about David. It's talking about King David and it's ultimately pointing us towards King David's greater son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we can say, think to ourselves as we sing this, uh, Lord our God, remember the greater son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ and the hardships which he bore. To the mighty one of Jacob, the Lord, this oath he has sworn, my house I will never enter, rest and slumber I will shun till I find the Lord a dwelling place fit for Jacob's mighty one. And that's expressing David's desire to build a house for God. And of course, David, 
David wasn't able to do it. Not even Solomon was able to build God a permanent house, but the Lord Jesus Christ, the greater son of David, has accomplished that fully. And then later in the psalm he says, uh, th uh, this is the Lord addressing David and uh, addressing God's people. He says, if your sons will keep my covenant and the statutes I make known, surely then your descendants will sit forever on your throne. For the Lord has chosen Zion, there he wishes to remain. Here is my resting place forever. It pleases me to reign. And now we're able to look at the heavenly Zion, the eternal resting place of God. And it also says, then surely your descendants will sit on your throne. And you think, it's only Jesus that sits on the throne of heaven. How can this be true of us? But of course, in Ephesians, Paul says that God has raised us up with him, with Christ, and seated us with him, with Christ, in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are already seated in heavenly places with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the final verse that we'll be singing says, I will bless her. I will bless the dwelling place of God. I will bless the church. I will bless her with abundance for her poor, much food I'll bring. I'll grant her priests salvation with joy her saints will sing. I will raise a horn for David, for the greater son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ, for my chosen one alight. I, his foes, with shame will cover. He'll be crowned with glory bright. And that's what Jesus has done. Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of all of this. And so we can take these wonderful old Psalms and we can sing them afresh and apply them to our own hearts, our own devotion, our own relationship with God as the people of God, as the New Testament people of God. The whole book of Psalms suddenly becomes relevant, directly relevant to us. We're gonna sing this to a, uh, a familiar hymn tune, thankfully. So you don't have to learn a new hymn tune, but these are wonderful words. And so as we look back on the Old Testament, sing this with joy, knowing that this is about you and me. It's about our relationship with Jesus.
Thank you for joining me for this uh, as we've worshipped God, as we've heard from the Old Testament and the New Testament. I hope and pray that that was a blessing for you. A big thank you for all of you that support the channel and make comments. But stay focused on Jesus. Stay close to him. And until next week, may God richly bless you. And now, will you say the grace with me? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.